Hello and welcome to another video in our short series celebrating elements in crystals from Cambridge Crystallographic Data Centre and the British Crystallographic Association. Today we're going to explore the elements they don't teach you about in school. I'm sure lots of you remember the classics of your chemistry lessons, things like carbon, nitrogen, gold and silver, but what about their less friendly neighbours in the periodic table? There are over 100 elements, so why did we spend so long on things like sodium and chlorine? Why didn't my teacher bring in a block of mercury for us to have a look at? The first element which I'm guessing wasn't brought into your classroom is fluorine. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's the most electronegative element and it sits at the top of group 7, the halogens. Underneath it are chlorine, bromine and iodine, chemistry favourites which display clear trends and are an integral part of many industrial reactions. Unfortunately, fluorine is just too dangerous to be let loose in the school, and is so reactive it can even make compounds with some noble gases. In fact, it's so electronegative that the only elements it's known not to react with are argon, helium and neon. In nature, fluorine is most commonly found as fluorite, an important structure in crystallography, as many other minerals have the same symmetry and organisation of atoms. Even though fluorine is often missed off the curriculum in favour of its friendlier relatives, it can be found in many kitchens as a key part of the non-stickiness of non-stick pans. These have a coating made from something called Teflon or polytetrafluoroethene, which is usually shortened to PTFE. PTFE is made up of carbon atoms with very, very tightly bound fluorine atoms attached to them, which prevent anything else from reacting with these carbons. The overall low reactivity gives PTFE a low coefficient of friction, so the things that we're cooking just slide right off. It's also the only known surface a gecko can't stick to. Cesium is another relative of some chemistry lesson classics. It's an alkali metal, which are famously reactive, but cesium puts lithium, sodium, rubidium, and even francium to shame. It ignites spontaneously in air and reacts explosively with water, even at low temperatures. It even reacts with ice at temperatures as low as minus 116 degrees Celsius. And it's the opposite of fluorine. It's the most electropositive element we commonly see. However, despite its danger, cesium is a pretty important element for our everyday lives, though we might not realise it. The International System of Units uses two specific wave counts from an emission spectrum of cesium-133 to codify the second, the unit of time, and the metre, the unit of distance. Cesium is still widely used behind the scenes in highly accurate atomic clocks. Cesium is mostly found in the mineral polysite, uh, which is cesium-aluminium silicate, and was nearly isolated from it, but Carl Plattner, the scientist investigating it, mistook cesium for sodium and potassium and eventually ran out of sample to analyse. Cesium can also be used in artificial crystals, such as helping balance the charges in this one, which is part of a group called energetic materials. This means it has lots of stored chemical potential energy, and they're used for things like fireworks or rocket propulsion. Mercury used to be used widely in schools, but its toxicity is well known now and you definitely won't find it in a classroom. Until pretty recently, it was a key part of thermometers, barometers, batteries and fluorescent lights. It can vaporise at room temperature and pressure, and the vapours are invisible, have no smell, and are soluble in oil and fat. The symptoms of mercury exposure are things like agitation, paralysis, sleep disorders, and, weirdly, a change in handwriting. The phrase mad as a hatter comes from the behavioural change seen in hatters after they were exposed repeatedly to significant quantities of mercury nitrate when cleaning animal pelts. It's most often found as the mineral cinnabar, which is a red rock and is where the pink colour vermilion comes from. This is one use which hasn't completely been phased out. Although it's very toxic and requires great care, this high-grade bright red paint pigment is so effective that some artists are willing to take the risk for the sake of getting the best colour payoff possible. For most artists, paints made from cadmium are a more than acceptable alternative. That brings us to the end of today's video. Thanks for helping celebrate elements in crystals. For more videos unpacking the elements and where we find them, 
follow CCDC Cambridge on YouTube, or check out their periodic table pages for more resources and ideas. You can also keep up to date by following the BCA or CCDC on Twitter. Have a look in the description for details. Many thanks to the Royal Society of Chemistry for their generous funding to complete this project, and most importantly to you for wanting to know more today than you did yesterday. See you next time!